Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the third of this year's Hitchcock Lectures by Sir Stephen Hawking, Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University. For many of you, this is the first talk you've ever heard in physics. So it's natural to ask why you came. Well, first of all, Stephen is one of the most distinguished living physicists who's made outstanding contributions to cosmology and to our understanding of black holes. And he's a leader in the attempt to develop a quantized theory of gravity. But that isn't the reason. Second, he's made most of these contributions while a victim of a debil debilitating disease that is still poorly understood. And I'm sure that at his first talk, many of you came to express your own admiration for a person who has overcome the limitations of his body to make great contributions. But that alone cannot account for the growth of the audience. You should know, by the way, that Wheeler Auditorium is full. <clears throat> and often we've seen the size of a lecture series dwindle from the first <laughs> to the last talk, while here the crowd just keeps growing. The reason, I believe, is that Stephen Hawking has a rare talent as a great communicator, and word has gotten out. You've heard from your friends that he talks on the great issues in physics in a way that you can understand. I was here two days ago, and I saw the audience then give its rapt attention to Stephen's remarks. And I later talked with people and sampled enough opinion of both scientists and laymen to learn that at all levels, people came away from that talk thinking that they had understood him. Very few scholars can make their work understandable to such a broad audience. And Stephen, this is one of your greatest talents, one that I wasn't previously aware of. Now I'd like to say something to the people of Berkeley who've turned out in large numbers today. A few years ago, J.K. Galbraith, a Berkeley alumnus, appeared at the Greek theater at Founders Day and remarked that Berkeley is the cradle of new ideas and new movements which gradually sweep across to the rest of the country. To you, the people of Berkeley, as well as to the university community, go the credit for these ideas and movements. And we at the university are very proud of the good relationship between the university and the community and we are truly moved by the size and the warmth of this audience for what will be an intellectual talk. Now, in the last three weeks at Berkeley and at other campuses of the university system and at Caltech, Stephen has given what I believe is 14 talks and he's traveled up and down the state, an amazing performance. I hope, Stephen, that you will look back fondly on these three weeks here and think of Berkeley as the place where you recognized fully the gift you have for communicating to people in simple terms what the human mind is capable of. Can you hear me? Mm. 
This lecture is under the direction of time. In his book, The Go Between, L.P. Hartley wrote, The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. But why is the past so different from the future? Why do we remember the past but not the future? In other words, why does time go forwards? Is this connected with the fact that the universe is expanding? The laws of physics do not distinguish between the past and the future. More precisely, the laws of physics are unchanged under the combination of operations known as E, P, and T. C means change particles for antiparticles. P means take the mirror image, so left and right are swapped for each other. And T means reverse the direction of motion of all particles. In effect, running the motion backwards. The laws of physics that govern the behavior of matter under all normal situations are unchanged under the operations C and P on their own. In other words, life would be just the same for the inhabitants of another planet who were our mirror images and who were made of antimatter. If you meet someone from another planet and he holds out his left hand, don't shake it. He might be made of antimatter. You would both disappear in a tremendous flash of light. If the laws of physics are unchanged by the combination of operations C and P, and also by the combination C, P and T, they must also be unchanged under the operation T alone. Yet there is a big difference between the forward and backward directions of time in ordinary life. Imagine a cup of water falling off a table and breaking in pieces on the floor. If you take a film of this, you can easily tell whether it is being run forward or backward. If you run it backward, you will see the pieces suddenly gather themselves together off the floor and jump back to form a whole cup on the table. You can tell that the film is being run backward because this kind of behavior is never observed in ordinary life. If it were, the crockery manufacturers would go out of business. <laughs> the explanation that is usually given as to why we don't see broken cups jumping back onto the table is that it is forbidden by the second law of thermodynamics. This says that disorder, or entropy, always increases with time. In other words, it is Murphy's Law. Things get worse. 